more honestly and, and, and more directly. The LMS is a great tool for sharing resources. It's a great tool for managing students, their grades. It is a terrible tool for sharing resources on the open web. I think we all know this, right? It's also a terrible tool to tell students that they control their data. Because when I put, when anyone puts your information in an LMS, what happens after the six months or the five months of that semester? It's deleted. It's telling students, we don't love you. <laughs> all the work you did, deleted. Really? So one of the problems with the LMS, and this is, this is actually issues that current LMS kind of um, designers, developers are thinking through, is the idea of giving students more control over that space, giving them the option to export that work into other spaces, and giving them the option to decide where I'm communicated with in this space and how. Right? Traditionally, this has been a tool that I would like to say the instructor controls, but not even you really control the LMS. Right? IT controls the LMS. Right? They ultimately control how much you can and can't do in there. Right? It's a, it's a kind of, it's a space of control. What's more, it's a space of control that's next to impossible in their current iterations to share openly online. And that gets at the heart of one of the problems when you're talking about open educational resources and open teaching and learning and doing it in the LMS. The two are often at odds with one another. It's kind of interesting that the Open Course Library recognized what you're doing in Angel and what can happen in Google Docs are two dramatically different experiences for the user and for being discovered. And the thing you want with open educational resources more than anything is them to be discovered. Because open is great. If it's not used, it's meaningless. It has no meaning. So interesting, LMS brings us here. Do, do you have a personalized namespace in the LMS? No. No one does. So it's not a personalized space. It is. It's a space that does certain things well in terms of management. Now, we know this. Some of you here have this access, right? Seven million students use Google Apps now. And same thing with Microsoft, not to just go on the Google train. Microsoft is doing <coughs> the same thing with Live.edu. No difference. Here's a question, though, that I think lies at the heart of our offloading student email to either Microsoft or Google and faculty email to either Microsoft or Google. It's a big question. And it's one that I'm interested in. And so I'm not, look, I'm not an investigative journalist. I'll be the first to tell you that. But I play one on TV. <laughs> so I actually tried to be one. So back in 2008, right about this time of year, so what, three years ago, Boston, I saw this thing in the Chronicle. Basically said, Boston College will stop offering new students email account altogether. Obviously, I was fascinated by this. I was like, okay, so they're basically going to get out of the email business. And the idea was this, and it was a brilliant idea. The idea was any, you come as a student to our university, whatever email you're using, you just sign up with that, and we'll send all your information there. So you don't have to take our, our university email. The problem being, students weren't using it anyway. Right? And that was a big issue. You have problems communicating with your students because they're not using the institutional email. So they had a way at this. And they said, we're going to just allow people to sign up. It's going to map onto their existing Boston College email, but they'll never see that. That will just be our version of it. It was an interesting model. And so I was like, OK, what happened? Well, the reason they did it was interesting. Here's their reason for doing this. And I'll get to the fact of whether they did it. Because I called Ms. Cochran on the phone. This was my being investigative journalist. I'll show you how that happened, how that turned out. Not too good. I don't have a future in that field. <laughs> Students weren't really using the Boston College accounts as much as we would like. It just becomes one more thing for them to check. Right? So this idea of one more space, which I can see as a good argument. And then college officials looked into outsourcing their email to Google or to Microsoft, as many other colleges and universities have. Both companies often such service reach colleges, hoping to hook students on their systems. But Ms. Corcoran said they decided against signing a deal with Google. The reason being, it's an increasingly <coughs> difficult contract to negotiate, but also we don't know the long-term implications, which is true. We don't know the long-term implications of getting into bed with Microsoft or Google as higher ed institutions. That's true. Now, 
Is it still worth it for many institutions, given that we're losing jobs in the situation we find ourselves financially in this country? Sure. So I'm not saying pragmatism doesn't have its space. It does. But there is a question we all need to ask if we're higher ed, right? Is what does that mean for us in the long run, right? What does getting into bed with Google mean or with Microsoft mean? Well, I'm not sure. And that's a question I'd actually just throw out there. I think there are implications when you say to a, basically an advertising agency, hey, take all our personal data. Yeah. I mean, is this a little weird? <laughs> no, they are an advertising company. That's where all their revenues come from. Let's be honest about this. OK, good. So I made my point, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, so I called Ms. Cochran at Boston College. And I said, you know, Ms. Cochran, I saw that awesome thing in 2008, about 2010, this, what happened? She said, can I call you back? I'm in a meeting. I said, yes. <laughs> I called her again. Ms. Cockrell, can I call you back? I'm actually running a lunch. Uh -huh. I called her again. Yeah. Okay? Never got back to me. Yeah. And so then I kind of didn't want to become a stalker because I had a family. <laughs> and I didn't want to, you know, because I was really interested. Why didn't they do this? Well, they never did do it. And I'm fascinated by it because it was such an interesting approach. The idea of let students use their own email, let them use their own spaces, but then we'll aggregate it intelligently as universities. You know, and this is one of the things that we're taking a shortcut with, with Google, Mail, and Microsoft. But let's, let's face it, when we do that, we're not giving our students a choice. Now, most students probably want to use Google anyway, but what if you go to Microsoft? Or vice versa, what if they love Microsoft and you go to Google? You're still compromising their ability to choose, which we haven't, you know, that's another issue. So that's a kind of, I thought was a hope, but it turned into a complete dead end. So let's talk a little bit about publishing platforms. Probably the point of why I'm here. Um, University of Mayor Washington, any questions up until now about the kind of evolution of tech and where we find ourselves? Because we find ourselves in some interesting situations. I think we find ourselves in one of the most interesting moments of the web, too. Because we, in many ways, can define it. And what that means um, is interesting. And I'll give you an example, a homegrown example, at UMW. University of Mary Washington blogs. What is it? It's an educational publishing platform. And what I love about this system, and this is kind of my baby, like me and this system started, started in 2007, and it's been running for four years. Uh, a yearly average, we get about 3.5 million views. Notice we have 4,000 students. On any given month, we get 150 unique visitors, 150,000 unique visitors, which is fascinating. We have this space that students are publishing to, and people are coming to it. Why? Because it's got insane Google juice. And we'll talk about what that means um, in a bit. But the fact that we have so many people publishing regularly to a platform really pumps up our search results in Google. That's a kind of very powerful thing when you think about it, and we'll talk about why. So it is, first and foremost, though, an educational publishing platform. And what does that mean? It means that our students and our faculty create resources through it. We use it as a place to reflect on our teaching and learning, and we use it as a place to create sites as resources. Here's a perfect example. This is Steve Greenlaw's um, site that him and his students created as a result of the 2008 financial crisis and global recession, which is still in our minds, right? It hasn't gone away. So this is something that people use. We have 15,000 visitors to this site on a monthly basis. People find this site, they use it, they comment. This has become an open educational resource. What's interesting about it is our faculty and students are creating this together. This is part of their process of building these sites. And this is not alone. Right? Like I said, we also have this one. This is a very interesting site. Remember I talked about uh, Fredericksburg? in the Civil War, current event. Well, my wife and I are from Brooklyn. Well, actually, my wife is from Italy. We lived together in Brooklyn, um, had our first kid in Brooklyn, and then ultimately we left to come to Virginia. And so Virginia, they take their history seriously. And no joke, that Frederick, the, the Civil War, they have all these historical markers. Well, when we first got to Fredericksburg, we got there on December 13th, um, 2005. Anyone know what might be significant about December 13th? It was the first day of 18th, the first war in Fredericksburg. 
that's when they converged on this place called Marie's Heights. And that's where the Irish were coming up the hill, the Irish Brigade, and they got slaughtered by the 